Starting in the early 1970s, personnel working aboard various airplanes started reporting strange things while traveling through the sky. Things that left them completely confused and absolutely terrified. But this isn't a story about UFOs. The things that people were reporting weren't seen through the windows. They were inside the aircraft. And to make things even more bizarre, they were only seen aboard one specific make and model of airplane. As the threads of the mystery slowly untangled over the years, researchers came to one conclusion, that a massive tragedy from the past was echoing into the present, causing panic and mayhem among everyone, including pilots, flight attendants, and passengers. You won't want to miss this one. In March of 1973, two flight attendants identified as Denise Woodruff and Ginny Packard boarded an Eastern Airlines flight traveling from New York City to Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Although they made flights like this all the time, the two of them were especially excited for today's work. That was because the aircraft designated plane 318 was a Lockheed L-1011 TriStar capable of seating up to 400 passengers. Like many of their co-workers, both Denise and Jenny bid for a trip on these planes as often as they could. In fact, Denise later identified herself as an L-1011 freak, saying that the sheer size of the aircraft often left the travelers in awe, which made them happier and more engaged, which made for an easier day in the air. Little did she know that it was this choice this specific model of plane that would bring her face to face with the unknown. You see, like on other airplanes, flight attendants have certain areas where they can get a little peace and quiet, or at least as much peace and quiet as you can get on a plane. On the L-1011, one of these spots was the service galley on the lower level. Down here, surrounded by stainless steel ovens capable of heating 200 meals at a time and lit by the bright glow of overhead lighting, the demands of the passengers were nowhere to be found. Well, once plane 318 is airborne, Jenny pops down to the galley for a moment to start prepping meals. The flight is full, and there is a lot of work to do. After getting everything set up, she returns topside in one of two small cramped elevators and starts asking the other flight attendants if she can help on the passenger deck. And then, once their needs are met, Jenny starts asking where Denise is, and she learns that the two of them just missed each other. As Jenny was ascending, Denise was descending the second elevator to the service galley to lend a helping hand. Well, after a quick laugh at how they just missed each other and hops back into the elevator, after a quick trip below deck, the doors open, and as she looks out into the galley, Ginny sees that Denise isn't anywhere to be found. Remember, this is a big plane, but the service galley itself isn't large. But even though she can't see Denise, Ginny knows that she's not alone. She's absolutely certain that someone else is hiding down there, crammed into some corner or one of the larger cabinets. That's when something dawns on her. That Denise, she's always one for a good prank. Well, Jenny thinks she's not going to let herself get rattled. And instead of calling out, she just acts like nothing is wrong and continues prepping meals. But Denise never completes her prank. There's never a dramatic scare or a boo or a gotcha. Everything is quiet, with the exception of the dull thrum from the engines. And soon, Ginny is just about done and decides to call Denise's bluff. But the longer she waits, the stranger everything seems. She's convinced that any second now, she's going to get jumped from behind. But nothing happens, and the feeling of being watched continues. The time in the galley drags on, only getting more uncomfortable and awkward. And finally, she gives up, laughs awkwardly at herself, and keeps working. Maybe she'll spot Denise as she continues meal prep. And then, the mood of everything shifts. Ginny's time in the galley changes from lighthearted expectation to panic-inducing dread. She can feel someone or something down there with her. Without even knowing it, she backs up against the bulkhead, staring at the empty galley, 
and she feels herself creeping towards the elevators, desperate for a chance to escape. After thumbing the button and climbing on board, the oppressive feeling lifts a little, but the normally short ride feels like it's taking forever to reach the passenger deck. Ginny is back among the smiling faces of her coworkers and passengers, but the light spilling into the cabin can't burn off the darkness that she finds surrounding her. And then another of the flight attendants, Mitty Darrow, sees Ginny, and the first thing she says is, Ginny, what on earth's the matter with you? Ginny knows that she looks like a mess. She could feel the blood draining from her face. She can see her hands shaking, and she manages to say as quietly as Mitty can hear her, I can't talk about it. Come with me. As the two of them retreat to the privacy of the rear of the airplane, Ginny only starts feeling more upset. When they reach a more secluded area, Ginny is surprised to find Denise, and she too looks terrified. Mitty says to Ginny, You're both more upset than I've ever seen you. Did the same thing happen to you that happened to Denise? That's when Ginny realizes that the same thing must have happened to her friend. After asking Denise what happened, she learns that Denise had the exact same experience with one crucial difference. While she was down in the service galley, Denise said that she too had felt another presence down there. When a wave of cold air hit her full force, the experience left Denise freezing, clammy, and running for the elevator. She had been trying to recover on the passenger deck ever since. Now, both Denise and Ginny swear Mitty to absolute secrecy. She agrees, and that's that. For a while, at least. A few weeks later, though, another flight attendant was working on plane 318. She, too, noticed something odd in the service galley. While working down there, the temperature noticeably dropped to the degree that it became intolerable. This happened when the ovens were running full blast, something that usually left the galley siphoning. Eventually, this third eyewitness fetched the flight engineer below decks, and he felt how cold it was too, but the thermometer that he carried with him clearly indicated it was 90 degrees down there in the galley. He simply shrugged it off and said that he would report it to the maintenance crew. In the meantime, Denise and Jenny pushed through their fear and continued to work. Several weeks after her initial experience, Jenny found herself again working on another L-1011. Again, it was plane 318, and just like before, she had to go down into the service galley. On this occasion, Jenny had finished heating the meals and was ready to send a load up on the elevator. But the elevators were running slowly, like they always did during peak periods. And the longer it takes the elevator to arrive, the more Jenny starts to grow impatient. She keeps hitting the button as memories of what happened earlier start to creep in. And so Jenny finally realizes that the elevator isn't in any hurry. So she leans back against the starboard side of the airplane. She closes her eyes for a moment, trying to make the seconds pass faster. And when she opens them, she glances to her left where a bulkhead separates the galley from a portion of the plane housing all the electrical equipment. And here, through the small porthole in the doorway leading to this section, she finally sees it. There, Jenny sees something lurking in the other section of the plane. Now at first, it looks like a mist or a fog. She can't make out much because there's a glare from the lights. But the more she looks, the more she's certain. And there's definitely something in there. Whatever it is, it isn't large. It's only about the size of a grapefruit. But something about its composition looks strange. She immediately rules out smoke. She knows it isn't condensation because a vent near her doesn't show any signs of that either. Both would constitute an emergency aboard an airplane. Whatever this is, it's different and it's growing larger by the second. And now it's the size of a basketball and seems to be getting more substantial on the other side of the glass porthole. She feels herself wanting to look away, but she can't. Researcher and author John G. Fuller described the experience of Ginny and other airline personnel. He described what Ginny saw. There was no question about it now. It was clearly forming into a face, half solid, half misty. She heard the elevator door above slam and the lift began to come down. She pushed the button frantically, even though it was unnecessary now. 
It seemed to be taking an interminable time to reach her. Just as the elevator reached a lower galley level, she looked again. It was a complete clear face now, with dark hair, gray at the sides and steel rimmed glasses now forming clearly on the three-dimensional image. There was no question it was a face, and no question that it was wearing glasses. They were now sharp and clear. This was the final touch. She had been able to try to rationalize the beginnings of the formation by explaining to herself that it hadn't be condensation, even though she knew it wasn't. The steel room glasses and their clearly identifiable hair removed any uncertainty from her mind. Well, after what feels like an eternity, the elevator finally arrives. She crams herself inside and when she reaches the passenger deck, heads straight for the bathroom. She barely manages to regain her composure, but as she stares into the mirror at her own face, she can't help but think about the face below deck, and she finally has some idea of what was happening. There is a ghost on plane 318. The only thing left to do is figure out who it is and why they're there. Another clue in the mystery would emerge around a month later. Denise, who was involved with the original Plane 318 encounters with Ginny, found herself in the flight attendant lounge at Newark Airport, and she couldn't help but overhear six other flight attendants chatting away about something odd that just recently happened. At the center of the conversation was a senior flight attendant, Sis Patterson. Sis had just gotten in from another airplane. You guessed it, it was Eastern Airlines Plane 318. As it turns out, the plane was ready to leave Newark and everything was in order. The caterers had just left, everyone was seated, and Sis was doing her final headcount. There was just one problem. She was off by one passenger. So she did the check again and quickly figured out the difference. There was an Eastern Airlines captain, fully uniformed, sitting in one of the seats that hadn't been accounted for. To Sis, it was clear what was happening. The captain had brought another plane to the airport and was dead heading hitching another ride back to Miami in first class. Despite how common this was, it was still protocol to confirm that this was happening. So Sis leaned in above the mysterious passenger, list in hand, and asked, Excuse me, Captain, but are you jump seat riding this trip? I don't have you on my list. Sis got no response. The captain simply stared into empty space. She assumed that he didn't hear her. She said, I beg your pardon, Captain. I've got to check you off either as a jump seat or first class pass rider. Could you help me? Still, the captain did not respond. He simply acted like she wasn't there. A few seconds later, the flight supervisor arrived at Sis's side, and she was met with the same response. The captain seemed oblivious. This naturally concerned both flight attendants, but they just couldn't coax a response out of the man. He was being incredibly rude at best, or was in some sort of trance at worst. With nothing else left to do, she went up to the cockpit to fetch the actual captain of the flight. Maybe the stranger would acknowledge someone that he viewed as a peer. Well, the flight captain was irritated. He was ready to get going and had plenty of other responsibilities to attend to before takeoff. But he knew that the issue needed to be addressed because he hadn't heard of another pilot deadheading on this flight either. And so the flight captain hauled himself out of the cockpit and made his way back to first class. By now, about six other passengers in the immediate vicinity were all watching intently at the bizarre drama playing out in front of them. The captain of plane 318 saw the other pilot right away. He leaned in close and was about to say something when he froze. He only said five words, my God. It's Bob Loft. No one knew who he was referring to. They didn't have a chance to ask either because the mysterious pilot in the seat simply disappeared. One second he was there, the next he was gone. There was just an empty first class seat. Everybody gasped. The flight captain staggered back and headed straight to the operations office in the airport. It ended up causing a delay of an entire hour, but both the flight crew and the first class passengers were simply too astounded to complain. When the report was filed and everybody aboard accounted for, plane 318 took off as scheduled. So if a report was made, 
there must be official documentation of the incident, right? I mean, how about the other things that happened aboard plane 318? Surely those were recorded somewhere too. Well, maybe, maybe not. According to John G. Fuller, Denise and Doris, another flight attendant who had experienced strange things, finally had a bright idea. The next time they were scheduled aboard that particular aircraft, they would check the plane's logbook. According to FAA regulations, anything that happened, no matter how big or how small, had to be recorded in the airplane's permanent record. On one side of each page, dedicated to a flight, the pilots recorded mechanical data. On the other, flight attendants wrote down everything else. Surely the logbook of plane 318 would be a treasure trove of events, many of which would corroborate everything that the flight attendants had experienced. Before boarding plane 318 again, Denise and her friend contacted Hal Griffin at the new scheduling office in Newark. He confirmed that the incident involving the disappearing captain had taken place. The entire crew disembarked, reported what happened, and entered the details into the flight log. John G. Fuller wrote, The confirmation by the crew schedule was more than Doris and Denise expected. They had been sure that the details must have been exaggerated and distorted as they made the rounds of the flight attendant lounges, the ticket counters, the baggage handlers, or the reservation desk. It seemed that everywhere they went, Eastern personnel were talking about it. It seemed so incredible their own experiences along with Ginny Packard's seemed pale in comparison. As they prepared to board plane flight number 318 for the return trip, the first thing they planned to do was to look at the logbook. They found it and picked it up with considerable tension and expectation. When they opened it, they noticed something very strange. All the pages up to and including the date of the incident had been removed. Contrary to general practice, whatever comments recorded by the captain and crew of that unusual flight were completely missing. Suffice to say, this is really unusual, illegal even. So what the heck was going on? Was Eastern Airlines involved in a cover-up? I mean, certainly airlines have never been involved in cover-ups before, right? Especially a company like Boeing, who's so reputable and well-known, this sort of conspiracy behavior is below them. Well, by now, rumors had started to spread all throughout the aviation industry about the haunted 318. Pilots and flight attendants for many of the companies, and not just Eastern Airlines, were starting to tell stories. There were all sorts of things. The sightings happened day or night, whenever the plane was in operation. Sometimes the ghosts were recognized, as in the event with the Phantom Captain that happened on the tarmac. Other times they were just reflections of indistinct faces in the oven doors of the galley. Temperature fluctuations down there continued, and on one occasion, another Phantom Captain supposedly repaired a broken oven that had overloaded a circuit. On other flights, they would appear, issue a warning regarding the plane's safety or operation, and then vanish. Sometimes, the ghosts appeared in the cockpit as full-bodied apparitions or simple reflections. In another incident, a flight captain entering the cockpit to perform the pre-flight check was met by a man who informed him matter-of-factly that the inspection had already been conducted. From time to time, a voice would come in over the intercom and deliver messages in flight, and it wasn't any of the pilots. The only problem was, no one wanted to report these stories firsthand. Eastern Airlines had a bad reputation for handling anything abnormal among their personnel. Anyone making a report of a haunted airplane was immediately assigned a psychiatrist. Soon, it became apparent that this was the first step in the airline letting you go. So, no one wanted to report anything out of the ordinary for fear of losing their jobs. This effect led many people to adopt a position where they wouldn't share their stories with their coworkers at all to say nothing of actually asking questions or investigating. But curious employees from other airlines had much more freedom when looking into the story. And one of the people who got wind of these reports was Captain whom John G. Fuller gave the pseudonym Al Morgan. Al was a pilot for the Trans World Airlines or TWA and told John, all I can tell you is hearsay, because it has not happened to me directly. 
I don't fly the L-1011s, but I've heard from many people I respect that a hostess went down to the galley below on one of the L-1011s released from Eastern and heard noises, unlike those she had ever heard on an airplane before. She called the flight engineer and he came down, but he couldn't identify the noises either. They were completely foreign to anything in the aircraft. So the girls just refused to go down to the galley anymore. However, Al had an interesting experience while landed in Phoenix, Arizona. When he arrived at one that morning for his own flight, he saw an L-1011 parked on the tarmac, surrounded by police cars with their lights on. Al said it was one of the Eastern Airlines planes that had been loaned to TWA, and Al eventually learned that the L-1011 had landed because, on the flight to Phoenix, a passenger had panicked on board. She went from completely silent to absolutely manic in a matter of seconds. She wore that she had been looking directly at an empty seat near her when a man suddenly appeared in it. He didn't walk up, he just materialized in the seat. And the moment she began to scream, the apparition vanished. The crew did their best to calm her nerves, but by the time they landed, it was apparent that they needed to call the police. As a matter of fact, the unfortunate passenger was taken away in a straitjacket. Another pilot told Al that he and his co-pilot had been doing their pre-flight check aboard an L-1011, loaned from an Eastern, when they too had a figure suddenly materialize in the cockpit's jump seat. The moment he was noticed, he vanished. Although the pilots still called in the flight attendants to help them check, none of the crew in the cabin had seen anyone enter or exit. These were just a few of the stories that Al Morgan had learned. But Al started to notice something. All of the tales that he was hearing from came from the same model of airplane. Every story of haunted airplanes that he had heard involved a Lockheed L-1011 TriStar. And Al started asking questions. He eventually started speaking with TWA Maintenance, asking if they had heard any stories like this because not only were they familiar with the tales, but they had a working theory. And here's where we start to get some possible answers. Airplanes are expensive. So whenever a plane crashed, it was routine to salvage any non-structural parts for reuse. Things like radios, avionic instruments, and other electronics would be taken from the crash, thoroughly tested for safety and then reused as repair parts on the same model. Or if you're a company like Boeing, you'll just reuse whatever looks operable. This was all simply standard operating procedure and a safe and cost-effective tool for facilitating repairs. Like Al Morgan, the TWA mechanics had noticed that all the haunted airplanes were Lockheed L-1011 TriStars. And interestingly, one of these planes had just crashed a few years earlier, and salvaged parts from that crash had been reused on airplanes of the same make and model, including Plane 318. The details of the crash of Plane 310 are well documented. At 9.20 p.m. on December 29, 1972, Eastern Airlines Flight 401 departed from New York's JFK Airport en route to Miami International. And just after 11.30, a landing gear light indicated that the nose gear was unresponsive. It turned out to just be a burned out bulb and not an actual malfunction, but it was enough to force the plane into a holding pattern above the Florida Everglades. From what investigators were able to determine, the cockpit crew removed the light assembly. But during this process, someone accidentally hit the control yoke on the aircraft. This deactivated the autopilot. No one noticed because the change was so subtle. And besides, everybody was preoccupied with the landing gear. Slowly but surely, the plane lost altitude. And by the time anyone realized it, it was too late. And just before midnight, plane 310's wing clipped the marshy soil of the Everglades. And in moments, the entire aircraft had broken apart, scattered across an area 330 feet wide and 1,600 feet long. The first person on the ground to notice the crashed 401 airplane was Robert Marcus. Robert was frog fishing in the Everglades when he saw the fireball and immediately piloted his airboat in its direction and he arrived on scene and began pulling people from the marsh. By 1215 on December 30th, a pair of rescue choppers had located the crash and rescue vehicles were dispatched. The casualties were devastating. 
of the 163 passengers, 96 were killed. Two of the 10 flight attendants also died, as well as the entire cockpit crew, three personnel in total, but miraculously, 75 survived, including a two-month-old infant, although many other died after being taken to the hospital. One of the survivors was flight attendant Dorius Ellett. Do you remember the flight attendant who had a thermometer brought to the service galley of Plane 318? That was Doris. She was on flight 401 when it went down and was also one of the people to report paranormal activity on Plane 318, which used parts of the 401 crash and its repairs. To make things even more bizarre, Doris experienced something strange in December of 1972, just a little while before boarding the ill-fated 401 flight. In his book, The Ghost of Flight 401, John G. Fuller wrote, Some two weeks earlier, Doris had been working a flight from JFK to Orlando when she was hit with what she described as a weird sick feeling. It was overpowering. In her mind's eyes, she saw clearly an L-1011 over the Everglades coming in on a flight approach to Miami International. It was dark and late at night. She saw the left wing crumble and a fuselage smash into the ground. She heard the cries of the injured. She had to stop work in a cabin and sit down. Note that this is exactly the route, location, and sequence involved in the Flight 401 crash. It's so specific that it almost sounds like Doris made it up afterwards. But here's the thing, folks. She told two of her fellow flight attendants at the time, and when they asked if it was the flight that they were currently on, Doris said it wasn't, but it's going to be real close around the holidays, closer to New Year's. Another person to survive the crash, if only for an hour, was the captain of Flight 401, Robert Bob Loft. Remember the Phantom Captain seen aboard Plane 318? The flight captain that day recognized him as Bob Loft, those who knew Bob before his death said that they were often able to identify the ghost on the other flights as belonging to him. Although the spirit of Bob Loft was sometimes seen, a ghost matching the description of another crew member appeared more often on other L-1011s. Second officer and flight engineer of Flight 401, Donald Don Repo, also survived the initial crash, but sadly, passed away in the hospital after 30 hours. Don's ghost was regularly seen aboard other L-1011s using pieces of the Flight 401 wreckage. According to one story, Don's ghost once appeared to another flight engineer to warn about an electrical failure. Although he didn't believe his eyes, the flight engineer investigated the area that Don had indicated and found a faulty circuit. Another incident involved a flight attendant who was in the galley of an L-1011 and she said that she clearly saw Don's reflection in the door of one of the ovens. The ghost lingered long enough for another flight attendant to join her. When her coworker arrived, Don's voice spoke to them, saying, Watch out for fire on this plane. The aircraft was destined for Mexico City and landed without incident. However, before moving on, a problem was discovered in one of the engines. The final leg of the flight was canceled, fulfilling Don's advice. On another L-1011 destined for Miami, a crew member was alerted by a loud knocking noise and it seemed to be coming from below the passenger deck. The crew member investigated the source of the sound by opening a trap door, but there was nothing there to make any noise. But as he turned around, he saw a flash of a person at the control panel. It was his old friend Don Repo back from the dead. And at one point, a member of another flight crew heard Don say that there will never be another crash of an L-1011. We won't let it happen. And today, this isn't true. There have been five fatal L-1011 accidents, but only one was ever due to a problem with the aircraft. But there may be a reason that Don's oath to keep L-1011s in the air failed. You see, Eastern Airlines no longer exists, and the haunting eventually stopped being reported. The final three airlines to use L-1011s had their last scheduled flights between 2007 and 2008. Today, Flight 401 is mostly famous through the work of someone I've mentioned several times, researcher and author John G. Fuller. 
And John's book on the crash and subsequent hauntings is full of the dozens of strange stories, and I heartily recommend that you check it out. There is even a section of the book dedicated to trying to contact the deceased passengers and crew of Flight 401. To varying degrees, it sounds like they succeeded. Former Eastern Airlines pilots and psychics who never met Don accurately described spirits matching his description. While working with flight attendant Elizabeth Manzione, John claimed that they had received messages from Don meant for his widow and family. These included nonsensical phrases that came through a Ouija board. Two phrases that eventually made sense were, Did mice leave that family closet to go in the wastebasket? Pennies sit there, boys room. John and Elizabeth later learned that Don's widow had been dealing with mice in their house. They also found a small barrel in Don's son's bedroom. Inside were stacks of Indian head pennies that Don had collected. The saga of Flight 401 is still a popular topic today, and many still debate the details of the haunting, with skeptics, of course, calling the sighting into question. But there are just too many details to ignore, from encounters that came from unrelated flight attendants, to the practice of reusing bits of wreckage, to Doris Elliott's chilling premonition. And because you guys have all made it to the end of this episode, I want you to leave a comment below that says, never flying again. So that way I know who made it to the end of the episode and who didn't. And if you guys enjoy storytelling like this, where we go over strange cases of the mysterious and supernatural, then what are you waiting for? Smack that like and subscribe button for more content just like this. As always, never forget, I love you all, keep an open mind, and I'll see you all in the very next episode.